Well, thank you all. Uh, today we're going to address insurability and why people need to take it seriously to help tackle the increasing risk of wildfires across the country. How do we incorporate current uh, innovations and normalize them into this new normal that we're talking about? And how do we educate everybody in this space? So the homeowners, government, insurers, builders, developers, landscapers, realtors, you know, uh, homeowners associations, all the people that are touching this that are going to impinge on the ability to do the work. Um, and, and the basic premise, right, is insurance incentivizes these elements to make the home safer. In California, obviously, we just hit the tipping point. Last week, Safer from Wildfire Regulation was announced after several weeks of uh, uh, very depressing news about insurers pulling out of the market, not writing new policies, and just doing a pause on who they were insuring. And so, you know, the hope is that, um, you know, insurance companies are going to be working with homeowners and regulators to recognize and reward wildfire safety and mitigation efforts, right? Um, they're going to submit new rates that are going to recognize the benefit of safety measures such, such as upgraded roofs and windows. Sorry, I didn't put my reading glasses on. A defensible space and membership and programs like FireWise USA and the Fire Risk Reduction Community Designation. Um, and then, of course, providing discounts to consumers that meet these elements so that insurance is affordable um, and not just available. And so I just realized I totally forgot I'm supposed to introduce two of you because I have your bios here. So um, start with Alistair. He joined IBHS in 2018, bringing 25 years of strategy consulting and management experience across public and private sectors. He's worked in financial services, risk management, broadcast media, which is why he talks so well when he's presenting to us, fast-moving consumers. As chief product officer, he leads their efforts to translate their top-tier science into action. In addition to his enterprise-wide leadership role, Alistair is also responsible for several programs that are critical, including the fortified building program they spoke about previously, Wildfire Prepared Home, which is active in California now, media, product design, commercial, membership, and IT infrastructure. Um, Alistair, I'm going to skip your um, academic credentials. I think everything else speaks. Um, Dave Shu, I have his bio. Louis, I'm going to have you introduce yourself because I forgot your bio. Uh, Dave retired from CAL FIRE in 2018. He was the staff chief for planning and risk analysis in the office of the state fire marshal. He established data collection programs for pre- and post-fire inspections, land use programming, and GIS analysis. Prior to his firefighting career, David was a licensed architect. Upon his retirement from CAL FIRE, he established Wildfire Defense Works, which is a consulting firm that improves community and structure resilience from wildfires. And he's provided consultation to many clients across the country to better help understand their own wildfire risk. He, David also works part-time for NFPA as a wildfire field representative with the FireWise USA program. And Louis, I will let you introduce yourself. My name is Louis Reno. I work for uh, Galway Holdings, which is a parent company of Epic Brokers, GenCap Wholesale, uh, Paragon Specialty Insurance, and MAI. Uh, I've been with the company, or one of the companies, for uh, 10 years. Uh, my background is primarily in uh, large, complex property uh, broking. Uh, and about for the past three years, I've been tasked with trying to do R&D and look at building a strategy to uh, create uh, more rate stability, better insurability, and try to create more, uh, uh, strengthen our clients' mitigation uh, uh, standards so that they're protected from wildfires. Thank you. And for all of you, the way we've structured this today's panel is um, I've got three questions for each of our panelists and then we'll take, uh, they'll address their points they want to make and then we'll take questions from the group. So sorry for whizzing through, but trying to get to give you the opportunity to ask your questions. So my first set of questions is for Alistair. My first question is what does wildfire prepared home provide? Uh, does it provide, how does it provide that path to insurability? Yes. <laughs> All of the, um, all of the above. Let me answer the rest of Tatiana's question uh, from my previous session. So if you just look at the facts, um, all the fires from the last decade, um, the existential crisis that some of the companies faced, uh, the fact that 80% of net written premium in the homeowner segment is represented by the companies that founded IVHS and support it every year. Um, 
the call to action to develop a wildfire mitigation program was a serious and intentional endeavor on their part. Uh, at first, the IBHS resisted it because if you look at wind, wind is just math. It's engineering. You determine the loads and you determine how much structural integrity you need strength and you can solve for that problem. You can make a structure resist 130 mile an hour winds, 140 mile an hour winds. If you can afford it, you could go up to 150, 160. Um, these are all deterministic problems. Wildfire, because there are three different sources of ignition and you've got weather mixed in there, it is not deterministic. And so we've always, coming from a place of comfort of math and engineering, we've always resisted doing a wildfire program. But we sat back and said, you know what? We've got 10, 10 plus years worth of information. We've got enough here to start a program and provide credible, meaningful mitigation at the parcel level and then at the community level to provide our members who have asked for it, uh, a mitigation program. That was the fall of 2021. By June of 2022, we had launched the program. And uh, 2023, we started to see mobilization of agents pushing the program out. I don't know what else other information or evidence you would need from a scientific body to say that the insurance industry was serious about wanting that mitigation program. Their rate filings that they were required to do under Commissioner Lara's regulation, nine of the companies which represent that 78% of the net written premium in California produced rate filings which are publicly available, you can get your hands on them, which specifically name wildfire prepared home as their answer to the regulation. And what may not be known broadly is we helped write the regulation, the requirement. I wish that we weren't given as much credit as the person next to me, um, but it was based entirely on our science. And so you have a program requested by the insurance industry, supported by, uh, supported by the rate filings with proposed uh, insurance discounts. Um, those have to be negotiated. They do range from 2% on the low end to 26% on the high end. So I think that's probably enough evidence to say that, yes, there is a pathway to insurability through that program. Thank you. Um, next question. What will it take for California homeowners, since that's what we're talking about, uh, for this piece specifically, to make their home ignition zone, that zone zero, non-combustible? Because I, I will just be really frank, that is the area everybody balks. You know, we've got our, we, we're conditioned to have the shrubs and the trees overhanging the house, and it just, it's not, it's a recipe for fire, not. Yes. Uh, the answer to all questions is yes. Right? Yes, yes. It, it, this, is, this is not an easy question. I know. No, it's not, and it's, that, that is the hard part, because that's what's different. Um, and, you know, people, there are, people react in different ways. Some people react with just absolute horror, um, and can't imagine a day when your shrubs are up in your eaves to a day when they're five feet from, from the house. They, can't, they just can't imagine or don't want it. Um, and so we, we're taking a couple of approaches. The softly approach is we have commissioned some uh, social science research with University of California in Berkeley with their architecture and engineering schools. That's, that is now ongoing right now. There's a one credit course uh, that they're doing. One, uh, an insurer has put up some money for prizes that's quite significant. There are uh, 85 students that have enrolled in the competition. And the competition is to come up with something that is visually appealing at different price points within zero to five, cognizant of the greater landscaping uh, need. Um, we, will get, we will get some research from this. Um, we'll get, people are gonna go knocking on doors and they're gonna ask questions and people are gonna tell them, I don't wanna move my vegetation. That's what the social science is gonna tell us. I'm quite confident of that. Um, and so what's it going to take? Um, 
if you look at, um, so what Julie talked about earlier, about Fortified in Alabama, there were mandated discounts um, that gave you a return on investment by upgrading to a Fortified roof. It would pay for itself through the discount. What she didn't say is that people were paying, so when I, when I lived in Mississippi, to give you a da data point, in the high wind zone, my insurance premium was $560 a month. So you can do the math. The premiums in the high wind areas in the, in the hurricane zone are much higher because they have accounted for that risk. And so if you reduce the risk, some insurers are willing to reduce their price by giving you a discount. The fair plan in California has rates which are similar in magnitude to what you're seeing in, this, in the Hurricane Coast. It's not clear to me that normal retail rates are nearly that high, and so it's very hard to get a return on investment if you're spending two or $3,000 to retrofit and you're getting 200 bucks off your premium every year. So some people are gonna say, no, I don't like the way it looks because I can't imagine it, and the economics are not there for me. Now, what they haven't perhaps realized is if they get dropped and they have to go into the fair plan, 10% of that number is pretty big. So, you know, be, be careful what you, be careful what you ignore, I guess, is the, is the lesson on that one. Um, and then, as you may be aware, in 2025, Zone Zero goes into law for new construction in California in 2026 for retrofits. That's the hammer if it's enforced. Yes, yeah, so there's three, three research lanes that I'm particularly excited about. One I mentioned a little bit about earlier, which is the building-to-building -building fire spread. One building is the source, another building is the target. What does it take to actually ignite the target when the source is ignited? Um, and that's all about the, the arc of flame that comes. Um, there are lots of dimensions to that, the shape of the building, the angle of the building. You would think that a building that's sitting at 45 degrees to the, to the other one might actually be more vulnerable. But the way fire works is something ignites if it is heating up faster than then it's cooling. And when you've got a building that's sitting at the, the corners facing you, it actually cools faster than it would if it had a direct hit. So there's all of these factors that are based in, baked into this. So we're trying to understand that with different sizes of buildings, different amounts of fuel, different wind levels, different angles. Uh, we're looking at aluminum buildings. We're looking at wood buildings, different types, different sizes, different loads of fuel. It's, it's, it's going to be pretty um, complicated. On the Windows side of thing, um, uh, there's a question out there, which is how, what is the performance of different types of window in terms of holding the glass in place. You mentioned earlier that the vinyl windows, it doesn't take much heat for them to melt. And you'll see that in our videos of, of the, the, the first pane drops out. Well, do fiberglass windows do the same thing? Don't know. We don't have that science yet. Do we need two layers of tempered if you have a frame that will hold the outer pane in place? Don't know yet. So those are things that, that we're, um, we're also gonna be researching. And then a glimmer of hope on uh, species, so we're not training our inspectors to be botanists, but we are um, looking at different species, and are there some species that with different moisture contents and such like would be okay to have a few of them in the zero to five zone? Right now, we don't, we don't know the answer to that, so we're, we say nothing. Um, but if you just think about it intuitively, um, azalea bushes, it turns out, are actually pretty resilient. Um, to find we've, we've burned them at different moisture levels and they're, they show some promise. There's still more research to be done. That's in sharp contrast to olive trees and eucalyptus, which is basically a bomb. 
and when you ignite it. Um, so there, there's a, some research to be done in that space too. Thank, thank you for that. And that, that ties into a comment of one of the panelists mentioned earlier about the, looking at resiliency. So you're looking at water resilient, fire resilient plants. There, there's some synergy there that I think we can take advantage of. Uh, my next set of questions is for Louis. Uh, first one is, can you elaborate on the unique role and importance of insurance in wildfire resiliency? Yeah, so I think this is important to touch upon because it's, it's often overlooked, especially in the insurance industry itself. And I think most people would be surprised that insurance plays a role beyond just paying out losses and being a source of mental anguish. And what that is, is that it provides the mechanism of incentivization. And so it has a purpose within the web of collaborative stakeholders and wildfire that need to play a part and work together. <clears throat> and with that, what I mean by, by that is there's a, a professor at uh, Cal Poly that I saw uh, speak on this, and he used an analogy that I, that I liked. His name's uh, Professor uh, Dickus. And the analogy was the carrot and the stick. And the stick is the regulations, the building codes, the mandates that has to reinforce and penalize people that don't follow. The carrot is the insurance, and that's the incentive with the rate, uh, rate relief and things like that to incentivize people to have a higher rate of compliance. Moreover, when you have a higher rate of compliance, you then have a bigger economy for wildfire, and so then you have more people or more businesses that come in that are innovators and provide more innovation towards resiliency. Another thing that's often overlooked with insurance is that the impact that it will ultimately have if things continue in this state in particular on property values. And there are lending requirements to have insurance for most mortgagees. And when we get to a state where it's just so cost prohibitive, it's going to impact the supply and demand of, of housing and who can actually afford to own a home in this state. And so it's, that's something, that's a, that's a key thing for, for everyone to think about and why the insurance industry and, and banks need to also support that since there's synergy between the two. Thank you for that. And, and just to dive into this a little bit, like how did we get here and what are the factors driving this current insurability crisis? Because, uh, you know, and, and we're, full disclosure, wearing my United Policyholders hat here, you know, we view insurance as the partner in getting this work done with homeowners and everyone else. So we, you know, but I feel the media sometimes unfairly villain vilifies the insurance industry as as doing something that's not helpful, and they're, they're actually underpinning our whole system. But so I'd like for you just to dive into how we got here a bit. Yeah. So this is. You could write a dissertation on the complexities of why the insurance industry is three in a minutes. situation. What's that? Three minutes. <laughs> so, um, but you know, just to from the things that I've seen that I think that are most important in terms of driving it, one is education. In terms of these mega fires that we're seeing, the insurance the ins insurance industry historically has never seen anything like this and has not been trained to underwrite. Or, and actuaries have not been able to assess or quantify how to then put this into an underwriting model. Since 2017, eight, out, eight of the 10 largest and most costly fires have occurred. And so this is a new th phenomenon for them to try to figure out. It, and with that, they, so they have little understanding of the mitigations and prevention work that go into that, and then how to actually fit that into an underwriting model as well. And part of that is because they, ha they don't have enough raw data for them to support into what, what they want to uh, put into their projections. But also, we're in one of the hardest markets that, that the property market has ever faced. And so there's, there's little time. These underwriters are inundated with risks, and they don't have as much time to put their arms around what do these mitigations and things mean. So it's... And, and with that, they also, with that training, the way that they're looking at it and the tools that they're using are often utilized for things like earthquake and wind and flood, where those models that they're utilizing are, are not geared towards how wildfire should be looked at. Whereas wildfire, you can have impactful measurements or things that can be put in place to deter an event from happening as well if, if one occurs, the magnitude of that. And they're looking at it from the standpoint of, okay, what in, in an area from a hazard model, 
what's the likelihood of an event going to happen in this in this proximity of this risk that I'm trying to write? Doesn't take into account fuel loads, the um, uh, the actual structure hardening and things like that. So it's not understanding the true vulnerability. So they're not getting a real tr understanding of what it is that they're that they're writing. I had a really interesting conversation with a, a notable uh, property executive of, of a carrier. And he said to me, you know, he, he, he said to me, I fucking hate modeling. And our and second, I, 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 the fact that this is my first curse word in the, in the amount of time that I'm talking about is, We're is, good. is miraculous. Um, no delicates so, here. So, but, but he said that what it has done in our industry since the eighties, we've become over-reliant on models and it's removed creativity and actually understanding what risks we're writing. And, and also it's led to bigger losses because we'll define our appetite by, the, by what the output of these models say. And then they write bigger line, line sizes on shared and layered programs, which lead to bigger losses. So, and I thought that was rather telling from, especially this is one of the biggest carriers in, in the property space. Um, another problem we have is you've got aggregation issues. So some of these carriers, what they're doing is they, they may have an understanding of where their, their spread of risk is, but these carriers are also providing capacity to third party MGAs and MGUs. And so they're not keeping track of where those MGAs and MGUs are writing risks. So what happens is they have higher concentrations of areas that they thought that they were, they were maintaining a spread of risk that, that made sense for them. But unfortunately, that's, it scares them because they end up having a spread of risk with all these other uh, entities that they're providing capacity to. And, and then the other thing is with the hard market that I mentioned, the global, the global property casualty market right now for 2022 had over 102% loss ratio. And what I mean by that is they have, they have spent more on claims than what they've taken in on premium. And as of this year at the six month mark, they were at over 104% loss ratio. And that doesn't take into account what happened to Maui. So it's a, number of, it's a number of those factors that are really driving it, uh, the, the main drivers as to the situation that we're in. And then there's reinsurance, and we're not going to talk about that because I, I like to geek on that. Most of you won't. So my last question for you, Louis, will be, so what are some of the solutions, and, and what can we do to get the insurance industry to adapt? Because we know they want to adapt. They've uh, strong-armed Alistair here with IBHS to, to, to come up with this program. And, and do this work? So one of the things that I've seen, you know, we did a, uh, our company did a summit in Napa uh, in early March. And the purpose of that was to really drive education, understanding of a lot of the things that go into mitigation, how to better model, how to better prepare, and also just illustrate the proactiveness of that community itself. So we had over 40 carriers and reinsurers um, represented about 90 different underwriters, mitigation companies, tech companies, researchers, IBHS was there talking about all these things, the efficacy of, of all of that. And it really, it really opened up their eyes to something that they didn't know anything about. Fast forward to last week, I was at a conference uh, in San Diego, WSIA, and I'm talking to some of those markets who, before when I brought up wildfire, they would laugh and not want to talk about it at all. They were asking, they were coming up to me, what's going on, what's going on with your strategy with wildfire? What are you doing? We're, we've changed how we've looked at this and we're trying to figure out a better way to provide more solutions uh, and, and adapt to what, what we're seeing in, in, in this space. So I think things like that are huge. Supporting things like IBHS and a number of universities in California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, that are, are really ahead of the game in terms of looking at all the dynamics of wildfire are really important. Um, government influence is obviously a big, big, big factor of that, and having the private-public uh, partnership is a huge driver in terms of the synergies. Uh, insurers and reinsurers, they need to develop more sophisticated models. One of the things that we're starting to see more and more of are vulnerability models. And what those do is they don't, they don't take into account what the, the likelihood of event is for, in a given area. What they take into account is, if a property is surrounded by fire, what's going to lead to ign ignition at that structure level? And that really gives a better sense of what, what their risk is that they're underwriting. Um, 
Another thing is community insurance coverage. We have to kind of change how we're looking about spread of risk. One of the things that I think is really hard for the industry to get its, its arms wrapped around is we need to actually have more write more concentrated risk because you can have more control in mandated, mandating those mitigation prevention measures that need to be put in place. Um, <clears throat> property owners and communities have, have got to have a higher rate of compliance. They also have to understand that there's gonna be higher retentions as well. And part of that is you're, they're also investing in themselves and they, they believe in what they've done to prepare for a wildfire. And so we need to be able to influence neighbors who are not taking part in that because they play a big part in their resilience. And lastly, it, just communication I think is key. Communication with all of the various stakeholders I think is integral to all of us getting anywhere and removing the egos and, and these you know, people that try to think, oh, we're the panacea. There is no panacea. All, all communities are different in how they need to approach, but there needs to be communication so that there are fewer mistakes and everybody is, is helping one another. Thank you for that. And this leads right into David just talking about this bigger picture piece, uh, either Michael work, I think. Um, so my first question for you is what programs already exist to help with this larger community-based response to wildfires? What would those look like? Uh, at a community level, uh, of course, there are a number of programs across the country, most notably uh, probably the Firewise USA program that NFPA created uh, and went into effect actually back in 2002. So it's a little over 20 years old. Across the country, there's over uh, 2,500 Firewise recognized sites uh, in 40 states. But there are actually over 725 of those communities just here in California alone. So the question is, why are so many of them in California? Because the insurance industry is actually recognizing the fact that when communities actually come together and recognize that they can form groups to help reduce their risk uh, as a community-wide basis, that that matters. And that the results of people, you know, from a protection standpoint at the individual home and parcel level, and then neighbors helping neighbors to recognize the risk at a community-wide level can actually make a difference. Now, there's still a lot of science out there about whether all of this works perfectly or not, because we've seen communities, uh, probably most notably uh, the Grizzly Flats community, uh, that was largely destroyed uh, from the Cold War fire in 2021 uh, was uh, a very long-standing firewise community. But the fact is that communities ha have people who engage and become aggressively active in taking steps and people who don't. And it kind of falls back on why do some people accept the science and the research that we're telling them that they can do to significantly reduce their risk. And others look at that and say, no, I don't want to do that. And, and we're dealing with social issues here that I don't have the answer for. But what we do know is those community-based organizations, there's also the Fire Adapted Communities Network, known as FACNET, and uh, you know a number of other programs that do similar things in a little bit different way uh, but a lot of it is still largely volunteer. I think that is going to rapidly change, and I'm hoping it does, to where politicians and elected officials will start requiring these types of things all the way from the beginning of land use planning efforts uh, and things like that. So I think it is a combination of the community recognizing their risk, voluntarily wanting to take steps to mitigate those risks and having the incentives from both insurance and the communities uh, from uh, local ordinances and requirements to actually help establish what those minimum guidelines are going to be. Thank you. And you've actually touched on my next yes. question to you, which is how do you break through the resistance? I think the only thing to add is those, you'd mentioned it when we, when we spoke previously, the demonstration gardens so people can see that this can be beautiful and make your home look beautiful and 
and to protect you from risk. So that education component that they've all talked about, I think is key. And Dave, do you mind just diving in a little deeper on what local government can do? Because they have both a, a carrot and a stick there that can be utilized here in a way that um, might not be comfortable with, but could certainly help move the needle. Of course. And so, you know, of course, there's federal laws, there's state laws, and then there's local laws. And that can even get down into even a more micro uh, HOA. Do you call them regulations? They're not really laws, but HOAs can pass uh, ordinances or, or guidelines that local residents in that homeowners group uh, need to follow. Uh, so I, I, I know having worked in CAL FIRE that the state, of course, passes the fire safety regulations through the public resource code. Local jurisdictions, whether they're counties or cities, uh, can adopt those outright or pass local ordinances that allow them to, they cannot, the, the restrictions are that they cannot pass local ordinances that are less restrictive than what the state guidelines are. So they have the freedom and the luxury, and many, many communities, uh, local cities and counties both, have passed local ordinances that actually exceed the minimum standards that the state puts forward. And those are some of the uh, carrot and stick approaches that local governments enjoy to be able to pass ordinances that require more restrictive requirements than even the state requires. And so that's that uh, you know incentivization, I think, of looking at you know, when you're creating, when Alistair mentioned the fact that, you know, people don't see it, they don't understand what it looks like. If we can create some really good examples that people can then look at and see in real time and real, you know, on the ground in their communities and, and largely recognize the fact that, oh, that's not so bad. I actually don't mind that. That doesn't, that's not anything like I thought it would be. I thought a bulldozer was going to come in and just scrape everything clear around my property. I can't believe people actually think that that's what's going to happen, but I've talked to people who believe that that is, that's what's in their head. And it couldn't be further from the truth. That's not what anybody is suggesting. So we have to kind of break through that barrier of what people think they are hearing and what they actually see as the recommendation and the example of what will work. And my experience is that once people actually see it, and they actually can buy into it, they look at it, and the general response is like, oh, that's not so bad. I think I can buy into that, and I'd, you know, I think I'll go home and try to do some of that myself. So uh, I think that's where we have to get, and we need to get there quickly. Thank you for that. And, and I think this, the, the refrain from everyone is education and, and really just getting people to understand their, their risk, uh, not have this, what, Jennifer, I think you called it magical thinking. Um, so we, we want to avoid the magical thinking. And yes, Jennifer, we're ready for some questions if, I, if you'd like to get your mic back. Hi, Gretchen Hayes from Napa Firewise. I have a question for David Chu. We've seen the ordinance that's gone into place in Napa County for helping people comply with defensible space. My bigger question is overall, how do we pay for enforcement for ordinances? They're only as good as they are followed by. You're absolutely correct, and I would say that not only how do we pay for the initial treatment of lands, but how do you continue to pay for the ongoing maintenance because it all grows back? So those are two very, very good questions, and I think that, uh, you know, that is one of the challenges. Now, here in Sonoma County, uh, you know, I see Carol Leone over there, so she can speak about the BRIC grant if anybody wants to ask her about that here in Sonoma County. Napa County was also just the recipient uh, just a few weeks ago of uh, a second BRIC grant, so we're going to learn all the pitfalls and challenges that Sonoma County has done and try to do it a little better. Um, that's not to mean that we'll do it better, but we have the luxury of coming behind them and doing that. So that's a lot of money. Collectively, it's about $50 million. And that's going to go a long way towards helping to fund those things, but it's only for a limited period of time. So during that time where we're using those funds and implementing that, we also have to be thinking about how do we continue to find funding sources that will continue to bring the value back. 
Uh, we all know, and this is where it gets a little tweaky, but we all know that, you know, depending on what study you want to follow, every dollar invested in prevention returns seven, 10, $12 on suppression costs and, and recovery costs when a fire hits. So the, the evidence is quite clear that investing dollars in prevention saves dollars down the road in suppression and recovery. So it's just a matter of deciding how do you want to spend your dollars? Do you want to spend it up front or do you want to spend it on the back end? And I would say that those are some very, very challenging issues because as we all know, prevention, if nothing happens, you're trying to prove a negative. It's because we did this work that nothing happened. And that's hard to do. But I think we can get there. It's just a matter of how we spend those dollars. That's a public public policy 101, suppression versus, you know, the other side of it. So, okay, any other questions? Thanks, Jen. Um, I feel like we have kind of a chicken or the egg situation where every time we have this conversation, it, it really comes back to the question of, like, whose responsibility is it to take the lead? Or if you talk to homeowners, they're going to say, well, wait a minute. First of all, can I afford this? Secondarily, even if I can't afford it, my neighbor doesn't do it then is it really helpful to me? And then what if I convince my neighbors to do it, but their neighbors on the other side don't do it? And oh, by the way, in a place like this, what if the county doesn't also do it, right? Let alone in places where there's a lot of state land. So we get to this place where there's a question of, is there a benefit to do it? In theory, there's a benefit to do it for all the reasons you guys just said. Statistically speaking, you are less likely to have a, a significant full loss event if you take certain steps and things like that. But it still comes back to the same problem of, is it the responsibility of each of us individually? And why aren't we having these conversations more collectively in an inclusive way? Or I guess, are you having these conversations with you know teaching not just individual homeowners, but local jurisdictions? you know, bringing in that state conversation. So it is a, a puzzle that is really wrapped around more thoroughly. Because right now it feels like a lot of these conversations are happening in silos, like the governor's recent executive order, right? Saying, okay, well, the commissioner has to talk to communities and then they have to meet or, you know, address these five goals, right? But again, you know, why are we not all here at the table? So do you have sort of thoughts on the best ways to approach that? Are there, are there communities that have done that effectively and lowered their overall risk and lowered their overall costs related to insurance? Or are we still kind of the, the blind leading the blind, hoping someone takes the lead? Uh, Julie mentioned a couple of success stories earlier. Let me, let me uh, add a little more color to those and draw out some of, this, some of the questions you're asking. Um, there is no magic measure by itself. It takes a collection of policy, financial incentives, and law um, to make these things happen at scale. Um, we see right now with, uh, with Wildfire Prepared Home, while we don't have a huge uh, uh, groundswell of activity on this in the lull that we're in right now, um, we see zealots coming forward and, and people that uh, have a problem that they're trying to solve and they're, they're aware, and so they're willing to take the steps. So those are, those are the minority of, of people. Um, take uh, North Carolina, so the barrier islands, that's wind. Um, there is, uh, they have taken, uh, 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 the wind pool there has taken an attitude of, we're going to invest in mitigation because it's going to drive down our losses. So they come from a position of having a billion dollars in surplus, so they invest 10, 20 million dollars and they give grants for roofs. And uh, after five hurricanes, they can show you that they've had a 35% reduction in frequency and a 22% reduction in severity, the claims. They are saving so much money. Um, that works in that market. In Alabama, where we have 40 odd thousand houses now that are, are built to mitigated standard, it took policy. The insurance commissioner, uh, Riddling, came together with builders, with uh, local politicians, and they put in place legislation and regulation and mandated a discount with a benchmark. 
So he said, if you build to this level, you insurer must give, is it much like a, it's a pretty sizable discount. So that worked in that market. And we're trying to figure out what's going to work in California. I thought he's super mindful of time. So it's like I, one I, minute and then we're going to, because I have to release you for lunch so that I don't start Yes, I'm you. standing in the way of everybody's lunch, but I, I feel like I want to make a statement that may resonate with the audience here in this room, but could probably get me run out of town to the general public, but I'm just going to say it anyway. You asked the question, is it whose responsibility is it? I simply don't know how much more impact it will take to prove to people, largely in this state, the Western United States and communities across the globe, that when you make a conscious choice to decide to live in a wildfire prone environment, that's a choice that you've made to live in a wildfire prone environment. And I'm going to be really blunt and say that if that's your choice and you want to live there, then you have a responsibility and an obligation to take the steps that we are now learning to be more conscientious about how to live successfully and cohesively in that wildfire environment. We have ignored that reality for the last 150 years. The time has come for everybody to stop asking who's going to help them and for everybody to collectively come together and work as a group, the politicians, the elected officials, fire departments, homeowners, homeowners groups, the whole litany architects designing things, landscapers who are shoveling the bark mulch up against the homes. They've got to stop it. And they need to learn so that everybody collectively comes together, recognizes the issue, and stops asking who's going to help me, but collectively everybody has to recognize we're the ones who chose to live here. And we have an obligation and a demand to take that seriously and do something about it. I'll just leave it there. Well, okay.